This is NTD Evening News. Live from our NTD Global Headquarters in New York City, here is Tiffany Meyer. Good evening and thank you for joining us tonight. Former President Trump's $175 million bond is safe in his New York civil fraud case. The court has just approved it. That's despite New York Attorney General Letitia James questioning its sufficiency. Knight Specialty Insurance issued the bond to secure Trump's compliance with a $454 million judgment. Judge Arthur Engaron ruled that Trump inflated his net worth and real estate assets to get better terms from banks and insurers. After a lengthy effort, Trump managed to secure a reduced bond while he appeals. James then raised doubts about the bond provider. The court just ruled that the provider has to keep the bond in full in cash and provide a guarantee of that to James every month. Turning to Trump's historic hush money trial, both the prosecution and the defense delivered their opening statements today. As he left the courthouse, Trump said today's court session went very well. Trump's hush money trial in New York was adjourned Monday afternoon after opening statements from both sides, as well as the first witness testimony. Here's Trump on his way out. I think it went very well. So you heard that yourself. This is a case that nobody wanted to bring, including Alvin Bragg. It was just at the last minute they decided to do it. It's a case that, uh, if you're looking back, it goes back many, many years, 2015, maybe before that. And it's a case as to bookkeeping, which is a very minor thing in terms of the law, in terms of all the violent crime that's going on outside as we, as we speak, right outside as we speak. The prosecution's opening statement argued that the case is a criminal conspiracy and said Trump tried to corrupt the 2016 election. The defense attorneys countered, saying the Manhattan District Attorney should never have brought this case. Trump is charged with 34 counts of falsifying business records before the 2016 presidential election, related to payments to adult film actress Stormy Daniels, who then signed an NDA. David Pecker, the former publisher of the National Enquirer, allegedly helped notify Trump that Daniels wanted to make allegations against him. Pecker was the prosecution's first witness Monday. The prosecution argues he would act as the eyes and ears for Trump's campaign by looking out for negative stories. At the testimony so far, he admitted that the publication had a practice of paying for some of its stories. The trial will feature other witnesses over the coming weeks, including Trump's former lawyer, Michael Cohen, Daniels, and Trump's communications director. Trump has said he also plans to testify. This is what took me off and takes me off the campaign trail because I should be in Georgia now. I should be in Florida now. I should be in a lot of different places right now campaigning and I'm sitting here and this will go on for a long time. It's very unfair. The judge is conflicted, as you know. It's very unfair what's going on and I should be allowed to campaign. The judge plans to adjourn the trial on Tuesday at 2 p.m. for Passover. After the trial on Tuesday, Trump is set to meet with former Japanese Prime Minister Taro Aso. Reporting by Allison Lee, NTD News. The Israeli military said today the head of its intelligence corps has resigned over the failure surrounding the October 7th attack. Aharon Haliva becomes the first senior Israeli figure to step down after the attack, where terrorists killed 1,200 people, mostly civilians. Haliva previously said that he shouldered the blame for not preventing the assault. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said Sunday that Israel will increase the political and military pressure on Hamas in the coming days. He added it's the only way to bring back the hostages and achieve victory. As the anti-Israel protests at Columbia University resurge and spread, New York congressmen held a rally to protect Jewish students. NTD's Fiona G was there and how's the story? Right here across the street from one of our finest institutions that at this point has been taken over, taken over by terrorists. That's what these people are. They're terrorists. If you're a pro-terrorist, you're a terrorist. A month after October 7th, and watched a 21-minute video, raw footage, unedited, 
of the Hamas terrorist attack on October 7th and listen to a young Palestinian man call home to his parents to say how he butchered 10 Jews with his bare hands. That level of hatred is taught. It's taught in the schools in Gaza. And unfortunately, we see it being taught on schools in America. I'm here on the streets right outside Columbia University where you can see behind me protests are still happening. Earlier today there was a rally right here to protect Jewish students where a congressman and other speakers called for university officials to take accountability and for Hamas to surrender. I had a chance to speak with some Columbia University students as well as members of the general public to find out more about the atmosphere here in the city right now. They have been chanting stuff like, you know, burn Tel Aviv to the ground, uh, which, which is where I'm from, so that's of course very concerning. Uh, asking, you know, uh, telling Zionists to, to leave campus, which is also pretty scary. I don't think I've thought about anything else since, and I think a lot of my classmates feel the same way. Everyone here is just like feeling the heightened emotions, and no one really knows what to do or what to say because you're scared to say the wrong thing. But the people that are advocating for the same thing are using this language. This language that I haven't heard and hasn't been mainstream in 80 years. What is uh, using the word kike is ridiculous. This is insane. Faculty members of Columbia University also held a large walkout this afternoon. Professors protested the university's decision to call the NYPD to arrest students at a pro-Palestinian encampment last week. Over 100 students were arrested. The walkout comes as students re-erected tents on campus today. Yeah, for over five days now, students at Columbia have been having an encampment on campus. Um, they are demanding divestment of their university um, from being complicit in Israel's crimes. They are demanding an end to the genocide of, Palis of Palestinians. Uncertainty and unrest continue on college campuses across the country. Columbia University announced today that all classes would be moved online in response to the protests, and over 40 students at Yale University were arrested in connection with protests. I'm Fiona G, NTD News. Is President Biden sending mixed messages? What he's saying about the protests on college campus as he tries to court young voters in the upcoming election. Entity's Iris Tao has more from Biden's speech today in Triangle, Virginia. And President Biden says he condemns anti-Semitic protests on college campuses, but that's not the only group he's condemning. Do you condemn the anti-Semitic protests on college campuses? I condemn the anti-Semitic protests. That's why I've set up a program to deal with that. I also condemn those who don't understand what's going on with the Palestinians. The mixed messaging comes after he issued a statement on Sunday about Passover in which he wrote, this blatant anti-Semitism is reprehensible and dangerous and has absolutely no place on college campuses. Biden's latest comments come as he's marking Earth Day here in Virginia, announcing new funding for solar projects. 900,000 will have solar on the rooftops for the first time and soon. And more of what he calls green job opportunities. It brings out the best in young people to do what's best for America. In a bid to court young voters, a key base for his re-election bid thus growing increasingly dissatisfied with his handling of the war in Gaza. Despite Biden's condemnation on anti-Semitism, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez calling the protest peaceful at the same event. As we one, once again witness the leadership of those peaceful student-led protests on campus is like Columbia. The White House, meanwhile, put out its own statement over the weekend, saying it condemns calls for violence and physical intimidation targeting Jewish students on Columbia's campus. Reporting from Triangle, Virginia, Iris Howe, NTD News. The Supreme Court today hearing a historic case about the growing issue of homelessness. It's weighing whether cities can punish people for sleeping outside when there's a lack of shelter space. This comes as record numbers of people are without a permanent place to live in the U.S. The Supreme Court on Monday confronted the nation's homelessness crisis. Justices heard arguments in a case that started in the small city of Grants Pass, Oregon. The city passed laws that prohibit sleeping in public places. Violators are fined almost $300. Repeat offenders faced up to 30 days in jail. Three homeless people sued the city over the law back in 2018. An appeals court found that banning camping in places without enough shelter amounts to cruel and unusual punishment. Grants Pass then appealed to the high court. 
A key point in this case is a 1962 Supreme Court ruling. It says that the Eighth Amendment bars punishing individuals based on their status. Grants Pass argues it's not punishing people for their status, but for the act of sleeping in public. Liberal justices on Monday disagreed. Where are they supposed to sleep? Are they supposed to kill themselves not sleeping? But a lawyer for the city argues that being homeless is not a status. A status is something that a person is when they're not doing anything. So being addicted, having cancer, being poor are all statuses that you have uh, apart from any conduct. Another issue is that the city doesn't offer any homeless shelters as alternatives to sleeping in public places. The closest shelter is in a neighboring city 10 minutes away. A lawyer for the plaintiffs used this point in his arguments. The city is implementing its policy of banishing people, its own residents. Banishment is a, is a strange word when you're talking about something 10 minutes away. Well, t well, but uh, again, the question is whether you could still realistically be part of the community where you grew up. Conservative justices seemed to side with the city during Monday's hearing. The liberal justices mostly leaned towards the plaintiffs. A ruling is due by the end of June. The Supreme Court will take up a major gun rights case this fall. It will review the Biden administration's regulation of so-called ghost guns. Ghost guns are kits that allow people to build untraceable guns at home. In 2022, the Biden administration changed the definition of a firearm under federal law to include unfinished parts so they can be tracked more easily. Those parts must be licensed and include serial numbers. Manufacturers must also run background checks before a sale. The requirement includes ghost guns made from individual parts or kits or by 3D printers. Last year, a U.S. district judge struck down the regulation and an appeals court agreed. The Biden administration is now appealing the decision to the Supreme Court. The justices have allowed the regulation to remain in effect while the lawsuit continues. Earlier, we spoke with Amber Duke, Washington editor for The Spectator, for more insight into the anti-Israel student protests at Columbia University. Amber Duke, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you back on the show. Thanks for having me. Now, Columbia University has been making the headlines as pro-Palestinian protests have taken over the campus. A rabbi is telling Jewish students to leave the school and seek safety. Now, this isn't just Columbia. We're also seeing at the University of Michigan today. There's pamphlets that say freedom for Palestine means death to America. How did we get to this stage? Unfortunately, this is sort of the end result of radical politics uh, pro proliferating across college campuses for really the past few decades. And a lot of these modern activists really view themselves as comparable to the free speech activists of the 60s and 70s and the anti-war protesters from that time as well. Um, but they've really crossed over into a very dark place. A lot of Jewish students have taken videos of some of the behavior that's been coming out of these encampments at places like Columbia and now Harvard University, where students are chanting death to America. They are talking about their love for Hamas and really crossing that line from expressing sentiments that are pro-Palestine into sentiments that are anti-Semitic. And college campuses for a long time have really refused to crack down on this type of behavior. As long as their students are engaging in left-wing political causes, they've been really reticent to push back on it. And they've also refused to punish students for breaking campus policy. Columbia was really one of the first major elite universities to say that these students were not allowed to engage in the type of protests that they were and tried to push back on them. But of course, that's now had the effect of students on other campuses trying to imitate the type of protests that they're engaging in. Stephen Fleet, who survived China's Cultural Revolution, wrote this. The Marxist-run Columbia University reaps what it sowed. Communist revolutionaries who are now turning Columbia into a people's university. What do you make of the Marxism angle here? It's a, a very important one because when we look at these progressive campus activists, they're all sort of guided by the same ideology, the same underpinnings for how they get to this anti-Israel position. And it comes a lot from the professors that these universities have hired. They have inculcated students with this idea that 
all of our societal battles, all of our cultural, political battles can be seen through a lens of oppressed versus oppressor. And because now we've added race into that through DEI initiatives, these students believe that no matter what the facts on the ground are, Israel has to be the oppressor because they are considered white by these student standards because the Palestinians are mostly a brown Arab population. And so through that dynamic, it makes sense why they've arrived here. They they believe that the white Jews are oppressing the Arab Palestinians, um, even though the history of this cause obviously goes back for millennia um, with these two groups fighting one another and uh, and have many reasons to be at war with one another besides the racial element. But these students really do view all of conflicts through that lens. Um, so they really couldn't see it any other way based on all of the propaganda that they've been taught regarding race and marginalized communities, et cetera. You actually have a book out called The Snowflakes Revolt, How Woke Millennials Hijacked American Media. I see it behind you as well. Tell us about that. How are we seeing that play out now? You're right. So I, I talk in the book a lot about my own experiences on campus. I went to Georgetown University between 2012 and 2016, and this was the really beginning of the idea of campuses creating safe spaces and trigger warnings for students who were afraid to encounter speech that disagreed with their own. And so it's important, I think, now to understand that these students who are protesting at Columbia and other campuses are really the same ones who have repeatedly tried to shut down conservative speakers from coming to campus, who have harassed their conservative peers to prevent them from speaking, to try to chill their ability to feel comfortable expressing their views. But now they're the ones angry at campus administrators for supposedly shutting down their speech. So there's a great irony here in the way that they're behaving and the arguments that they're advancing to justify the fact that they are outright expressing hatred towards their Jewish peers on campus, as well as violating campus policy in the process. Columbia had given them several warnings that they were not allowed to have this encampment there. It was right outside of the library and several classrooms just a few days before students started taking their final exams and they refused to leave. So they were met with the appropriate punishment, which was suspension, in some cases expulsion and removal from the campus. Um, but now they're saying that this was all about uh, cutting back on their speech, but the university apparently offered multiple times for these students to come and meet with administrators and actually talk about what it is that they were advocating for, and they declined to do so, instead choosing to engage in this very rowdy protest. And this is something that I write about in the book as well. It's not really about students wanting to have a real dialogue with administrators and reach some kind of common ground or solution. They really just want to try to intimidate people as much as possible and create a PR nightmare for the university to the point that administrators are required to accept all of their demands. And if they don't do so, they will call the administrators racist and use other derogatory terms to try to uh, basically mar them in the, in the public eye. On that note, one commentator wrote, quote, communist ideology never dies, it just retreats to academia. What do you make of that, especially given what you found and talk about in your book? Right, I mean, that's partially true, that it used to be that radical ideology went back to academia. But unfortunately, over the past 10 to 20 years, we've actually seen that other industries are being infiltrated by this radical Marxist ideology. And that's how we've ended up with corporations taking on things like DEI and CRT, and even uh, schools, we get much before universities, elementary, middle, and high school have taken on these ideologies as well and are trying to use them to indoctrinate even younger and younger students. Um, because these other industries are hiring just the same from elite institutions and in some cases actually value the idea of a student having this long resume of political activism and perhaps what they didn't realize is that these students were going to use the same tactics that they used on campus to sway administration policy to change corporate policy so whether it's Hollywood academia uh, corporate America or politics, pretty much every major institution in America has absolutely been infiltrated by these radicals. And we're seeing the results of that where everything has become quote unquote woke 
and the normal mainstream view is no longer represented um, and Americans feel very strongly that a lot of these institutions don't really represent them anymore. Amber Duke, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Secretary of State Antony Blinken released the annual Human Rights Report today, which analyzes other nations' human rights records. Some of the most serious violations listed are from the Chinese Communist Party. This comes ahead of Blinken's visit to China this week. NTD's Jack Bradley has more from the State Department. Secretary Blinken is expected to talk about China's human rights abuses on his visit to China this week. Now, this comes amid a report that was released in annual Country Reports on Human Rights Practices, which covers nearly 200 countries and territories. It details the Chinese regime's crimes against humanity, particularly targeting practitioners of religious belief, like the Muslim Uyghurs or Falun Gong, a Buddhist-based practice centered around the tenets of truthfulness, compassion, and tolerance. Now, here's Robert Gilchrist, the senior official in the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights and Labor. And he will, as he does in all of his engagements with the PRC, raise human rights at the highest levels and in the clearest way. Um, and, and that means with regard to the, the full array of concerns that we have um, with, the, with the PRC. Um, and we'll go into details with regard to specific conversations, but of course this is an issue that, that remains of concern and is one that we raise with our, with our Chinese um, co um, counterparts. The report highlights the Chinese regime's killings, imprisonment, and forced organ harvesting of Uyghurs and practitioners of Falun Gong. Now, as these individuals uh, experience this persecution, they face propaganda from state-run media to defame their reputations. And as this report comes to light, Blinken sure has a lot to talk about on his trip to China this week. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Jack Bradley, NTD News. April 25th will mark the 25th anniversary of a historic peaceful appeal in Beijing. Falun Gong practitioners all over the world are commemorating the day to raise awareness about the ongoing persecution of Falun Gong inside communist China. NTD's Sam Wong has more. We're here outside the Chinese embassy in Washington, D.C., and right behind me are a group of Falun Gong practitioners. They're gathering here to commemorate a historical event that is believed to be the prelude to a nationwide persecution. April 25th will mark the 25th anniversary of a peaceful appeal in Beijing. On that day, tens of thousands of Falun Gong practitioners lined up outside the Chinese Communist Party's central compound, Zhongnanhai. They wished to ask authorities to release the dozens of practitioners who had been arrested after they appealed over a slanderous article published in a stay-back magazine. There was no one moving around. Nobody was talking and no one was yelling. Everything was harmonious. We try to follow that spirit to continue to, uh, to let people know that uh, we can, through the peaceful dialogue, to communicate. The appeal concluded after a high-ranking official met face-to-face -face with a demonstrator. He agreed to release the practitioners who had been arrested. But three months later, then-Chinese leader Jiang Zemin spearheaded a nationwide persecution against Falun Gong. Millions have been detained, hundreds of thousands were reportedly tortured and abused in custody. There is evidence that some were even killed on demand to supply the regime's organ transplant market. Last year, as example, 2023, okay, there are 2000, uh, 209 Falun Gong practitioners being tortured to death, ranged from 23 years old up to 93 years old, from all walks of life. Falun Gong, also known as Falun Dafa, is a spiritual discipline that consists of five gentle, slow-moving exercises. The core teachings of truthfulness, compassion, and forbearance are at the center of the spiritual practice. It makes me a better uh, person, or at least uh, trying to become a better person. When you're sort of having ups and downs, uh, it just gives you sort of that even keel you just internalize. If you look within and you, and you try to improve yourself, then everything will just take its course. Despite ongoing persecution, Falun Gong practitioners continue to raise awareness as rallies are held around the world to commemorate this day. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Sam Wong, NTD News. Joining me now to discuss Trump's trial today is Gerard Filetti, senior counsel at the Lawfare Project. Gerard, thanks for joining us. Now, prosecutors today sought to reframe their case against Trump, arguing that it's not just about the hush money payment, but that Trump schemed to, quote, corrupt the 2016 presidential election with this payment to Cohen. What do you make of this argument? 
Well, that's the argument that the prosecution has to make because paying money in connection with a non-disclosure agreement, what's called a hush money in this case, is not in itself illegal. The prosecution can only convict Trump if they prove that he did that for an impermissible purpose, which was to interfere in, with the election, uh, to get a benefit for his campaign without declaring it. Uh, so essentially, the prosecution does need to show that Donald Trump did all of this in, in order to gain an advantage in the 2016 election, because otherwise they don't have a case. To your point, this is the argument prosecutors are using to justify turning falsifying business records into a felony charge, not just a misdemeanor. Now, how much legal weight does this interpretation of the law carry in your view? Will it hold up? It's a very novel interpretation. This has not been tried before. And quite frankly, it's offensive to some principles in law because you're taking misdemeanors for which the statute of limitations has expired and you're bringing the same facts to trial as a felony where the statute of limitations is longer because you're stretching to make an argument that this was intended to interfere with an election rather than, for example, to save him embarrassment or to save uh, his marriage. So this is a stretch, one that's not been attempted before, and it may very well not hold up on appeal. On that note, let's say that this was intended to influence the election, as the prosecution argues. Is influencing the election in this manner illegal? Influencing or trying to influence the election is not in itself illegal. That's what an election is all about, trying to influence who votes for you. What is at issue is whether there is technically completion of disclosure requirements for one's campaign, for Donald Trump's campaign. In other words, if this payment of money was a benefit to him for his campaign to be president, then he needed to declare that money as something that was spent by his campaign or in order to get into office. And because he did not declare that, that is what the prosecution is saying is illegal or illegal in interference with the election, not the act of obtaining an agreement, but rather not declaring it as a campaign benefit. Hmm. The defense, meanwhile, is arguing that the checks Trump cut to Cohen in 2017 were actually for legitimate legal serv services provided by Cohen. Break down this argument for us. It's a good argument, and it's the correct one. He, Donald Trump paid his lawyer to arrange for a settlement agreement and paid money to his lawyer to pay as part of that non-disclosure agreement. There's nothing improper about that. The only thing that's improper that's alleged to be improper is how that money was accounted for in business records. And that's not something that Donald Trump himself directed, although the prosecution is trying to make that claim. That's a, a business expense that was handled in the normal course of business and does not by itself indicate an intent to do anything illegal, just to do what Donald Trump set out to do, which is to pay money for an agreement and to pay his lawyer. Now, today was a short day, but the prosecution did call its first witness, David Pecker. What is the significance of this witness? Did he add anything noteworthy? There's nothing what we did not know today, uh, today that we didn't already know. It, uh, today's testimony involved uh, the, the catch and kill policy that the National Enquirer had with regard to Donald Trump, where they looked at news stories that were potentially harmful to Trump, bought the rights to those stories, and then killed them so they would not be public. There's nothing illegal about that either. So this is really just telling a story about how Donald Trump was looking to protect his reputation. But from the prosecutor's point of view, all of this was done for an impermissible purpose. Hmm. Now, a hearing is set for tomorrow morning on whether or not Trump violated the gag order. Trial witnesses are protected under the order, including Trump's former attorney, Michael Cohen. Now, Cohen has been on national TV slamming Trump, but Trump is not allowed to respond to Cohen's accusations. Why is that? Do you see the order as justified in this case? The order, the gag order is usually justified in cases where you have high profile uh, defendants and a high profile case where you don't want to influence the jury and you don't want to threaten or have the appearance of threatening any witnesses. Now, in, in all fairness, usually gag orders are, are on both sides. The judge doesn't want prosecution witnesses to be out speaking and, and swaying opinion either. So what is a little bit unusual here is that they're only applying it to Donald Trump, but also not to Michael Cohen or other witnesses, which may in the end save Donald Trump from a contempt citation uh, because this is a unilateral, it's a very one-sided order. Gerard Felitti, Senior Counsel at the Lawfare Project, thank you so much for joining us. Trump is on the brink of receiving another windfall, around $1.3 billion worth in additional Truth Social stock. NTD's Virginia Gibson explains. 
Trump is in line to obtain around $1.3 billion in Truth Social stock, bringing his overall ownership into the $4 billion range. SEC filings say Truth Social can issue these new shares to Trump. If the stock hits certain benchmarks, it would have to stay above $17.50 a share for 20 days in a row. Truth Social is trading above the required price, but it has to stay there on Tuesday the 20th day. He's going to come out ahead uh, as a winner, um, pretty much regardless of what the stock price will do in the short term. Financial expert VJ Marolia says Donald Trump is certain to collect. The stock has stood firm around a high $35 per share. The only way Trump loses is if it dramatically collapses before Tuesday's closing bell. The value of Trump's shares only exists on paper. The actual cash amount he could collect is uncertain. The stock is extremely volatile, bouncing up and down at over 1,000 times sales. The typical social media stock trades at 10 times sales. They're trying to compare it to, let's say, the S&P 500 or a typical company that has, um, let's say, been uh, run by a founder for uh, decades over time. But that's not what this is. This is A, a startup. This is two, a media company. When you have a brand this strong, he's arguably the most famous human being on the planet. Uh, it's hard to put a valuation on that. Marolia says the math is different for startups, such as Trump's Truth Social. There isn't a lot of operating history, so it's hard to predict future performance. Mar Virginia Gibson, NTD News. The House Republican Conference is divided over the future of its leadership as the Senate takes up a foreign aid bill that could see TikTok banned from app stores in the United States. Our Washington correspondent Luis Martinez has more. The House of Representatives passed on Saturday a $95 billion supplemental foreign aid package for Israel, Taiwan and Ukraine, despite having the majority of the Republican majority voting against sending two-thirds of those resources to Ukraine. I'd like to start to express the words of gratitude uh, for the Congress, for the House of Representatives, uh, the words of gratitude to the American people, to the President Biden and his administrations. Ukrainian officials expressed their gratitude towards the United States, while some Republican congressmen strongly opposed the foreign aid package that did not include any border security provisions. I do not support Mike Johnson. He's already a lame duck. If we have the vote today in our conference, he would not be speaker today. He's already a lame duck. Unfortunately, without border security, I can't go back to the people I represent and say, hey, we're doing nothing for you for the border, but but here's a hundred uh, now another $95 billion for foreign aid. I can't, I can't support that. There's at least three congressmen who have voiced openly and publicly that they would support a motion to vacate the speakership. That's Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene, the Republican from Georgia, who filed a motion to vacate the speakership over a month ago. Then there is Paul Gossar, the congressman from Arizona, and Tom Massey, the congressman from Kentucky, who went as far as asking for the speaker's resignation. We want him to resign and to announce his resignation so that we don't go speakerless for a period of time. Speaker Mike Johnson defended his policy choices despite having the majority of the Republican conference vote against his Ukraine bill. We gave our members a voice. We gave them a chance. We gave them a better process and ultimately a much better uh, policy. On Tuesday, the Senate will begin debating the $95 billion supplemental foreign aid package for Israel, Ukraine and Taiwan, which also includes a ban on TikTok. And President Biden has already announced that he's willing to sign such a bill. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Luis Eduardo Martinez, NTD News. With TikTok in the spotlight, lawmakers are fearing a communist Chinese Trojan horse. Join me on China in Focus tonight at 9.30 p.m. Eastern. We'll delve into the just-passed House bill that could lead to its ban, along with exclusive expert insights on the bill's future. The U.S. is successfully blocking China's microchip development, according to Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo. She said the chip that's powering Huawei's Mate 60 Pro phone isn't as advanced as American chips. The Mate 60 handset debuted last year, powered by an advanced locally made chip. Last week, the phone maker unveiled new models thought to use an upgraded version of the silicon. The chips are reportedly made by China's Semiconductor Manufacturing International Corp. 
In Beijing, that's been cast as evidence of the country's ability to overcome restrictions on the supply of advanced semiconductors. Over the weekend, U.S. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo said the reverse was true. Speaking to CBS, she said the Chinese chips were nowhere near as advanced as the latest U.S. models, and hence proof that the supply curbs are working. Huawei has been on a Washington blacklist for years. That's over allegations that it could help spy on Americans, charges the firm denies. Restrictions have also been imposed on Chinese semiconductor manufacturers. The Biden administration says it continues to evaluate whether Huawei's new chips have violated export rules. A Chicago police officer tragically killed over the weekend. Authorities say the officer was returning home from work when he was shot several times. He died just two days before his 31st birthday. NTD's Jason Blair has more. Officer Luis M. Huesca was found shot near his home close to 3 a.m. on Sunday. He was taken to a hospital where he was pronounced dead. He was a six-year police veteran, and the shooting tragically happened just days before his 31st birthday. He was driving home from a shift and still had his uniform on. Chicago Superintendent Larry Snelling said in a press conference on Sunday, quote, Another sad day for the Chicago Police Department. We lost one of our own today. Chicago Mayor Brandon Johnson posted on X, quote, We are deeply mourning the death of Officer Luis M. Huesca of the 5th District Priority Response Team following an act of unconscionable gun violence in our city. Chicago Alderman Ray Lopez said on X that sound monitoring technology shot spotter alerted police to the sound of gunshots five minutes before the first 911 call regarding Officer Huesca. ShotSpotter has been contracted with the city since at least 2018. Mayor Johnson announced in February that the city will not renew the contract and will decommission its use in September. During his campaign, Johnson cited, there is, quote, clear evidence it is unreliable and overly susceptible to human error. Superintendent Snelling said that they are still putting together evidence to determine a motive, but they do know that Huesca's car was taken. Jason Blair, NTD News. And now for your sports news, we're joined by NTD's Dave Martin. Dave, a busy weekend in sports, but let's start in golf, where the number one ranked PGA and LPGA players are dominating each tour. Now, who's been more impressive of late, Scotty Scheffler or Nelly Korda? You know, probably Nelly Korda, just by a hair. I mean, she just won the Chevron Championship. That's a major. Has won now five straight LPGA events. Hasn't finished out of first place since January, which is incredible. The last person to win five in a row was Annika Sorenstam. That was nearly two decades in a row. No one has ever won six straight events. Scheffler, meanwhile, he just won the RBC Heritage in a delayed finish this morning. That's his fourth win out of the last five events, including the Masters last week. And the one he didn't win, he actually finished second in. And these events, I mean, these have over 100 players in them. That's why it's so difficult to keep winning. Now, his streak could be interrupted soon. His wife is due with her first child next week. Now, both Scheffler and Corda are ranked number one, like you said. But it's rare to see this kind of dominance from a single player on either tour, you know, let alone um, at the same time. Well, another piece of interesting golf news is a 15 year old named Miles Russell became the youngest player to make the weekend cut on the Corn Ferry Tour. How significant is this? You know, I think it's very significant. Now, the Corn Ferry Tour is like the minor leagues of the PGA Tour. The top 30 players earn PGA membership for the following season. Scotty Scheffler, we just mentioned, he actually finished number one there in 2019. But Scheffler, five years ago, he would have been 23 at the time. This kid, Miles Russell, he's 15. That's like a high school freshman. I mean, that's a huge difference as far as men's development is concerned. Now, it doesn't look like he's on schedule to finish first, like Scheffler did, at least this season anyway. But he's obviously able to hold his own right now. I mean, he finished 20th in this event. That's the first player ever to finish the top 25 at age 15. He also won the American Junior Golf Association Player of the Year at a younger age than Tiger Woods. So we could be looking at a future star here. Well, turning now to NFL news, the Jets have reportedly traded quarterback Zach Wilson to Denver. Given that he was viewed as the Jets quarterback of the future, do you think they take a quarterback in the first round on Thursday? I don't think so. I mean, the Jets are in like win now mode. You know, they have Aaron Rodgers for this coming season, but he's 40. He's won four MVP awards. They don't know how much longer he's going to uh, keep playing. Plus, they have a great defense right now to pair with him. 
I would guess they'll go with a player to help them as soon as possible, maybe an offensive lineman or a wide receiver, maybe a tight end. But I think with this Wilson trade, it really shows just how difficult it is to scout a quarterback. Wilson was the second overall pick in the draft just three years ago, and now he's reportedly been traded for a late round pick swap that's very little. And now he's one of four quarterbacks taken in the first round of that 2021 draft who've already lost their jobs and been traded. Only Trevor Lawrence, who was taken first, is left. Now, meanwhile, San Francisco took Brock Purdy with the very last pick in the draft uh, the year later. He's already one of the best in the game, so it shows how scouting can be a very humbling profession sometimes. Well, in NBA news, the playoffs started Saturday with every series playing at least one game. What are some of the biggest storylines so far? You know, I think at this point, some of the matchups in general are what's most compelling. You know, you've got Boston versus Miami. This is a rematch of last year's very memorable conference finals where the Heat won the first three games. And the Celtics rallied. They won the next three to force a game seven at home, only to lose and see the Heat play in the finals. And this has become quite the playoff rival. This is the fourth time in the last five years these two teams are meeting. Unfortunately for Miami, six-time All-Star Jimmy Butler is going to be out for this series. Now, in the Western Conference, the Lake Nuggets-Lakers series has all the attention for good reason. You've got the Nuggets, who are the defending champions. They've also got Nikola Jokic, who's probably going to win his third MVP in the last four years. Uh, they swept the Lakers last year in a much-anticipated battle. Uh, that was a kind of a shocking uh, result. But the Lakers, they've got LeBron James, still the most popular player in the game. I think everyone's interested to see how he responds. Game two is uh, tonight, though. His uh, Lakers are down one to nothing. Well, Dave, as always, thanks for joining us. Well, thank you, Tiff.